Hey everybody, this is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. And welcome to the Invested Podcast. We are talking about Vista Outdoors. We are! Months yeah. later. <clears throat> Not really months. We, we, we but we're getting last there. Week, <clears throat> we wrapped up last week talking about compounders. The idea that you buy a company and it simply uses your investment capital in a, in a way, I guess in a sort of a way, but whatever, you own equity in this company and it compounds the equity in the company at a very high rate of return, um, 15% per year. Mm-hmm. And ideally it lasts for 50 years doing that. That would be fantastic. In which case $10,000 would become a million, or sorry, $10 million. And um, since that rarely happens, we'll call that a unicorn. But we can certainly find compounders that can do what a bond does, which is allow you to put your money away and it just compounds the money over time without you having to think much about it. Now with a stock, of course, you have to think a little more about it because you're actually the owner of the company and you want to be paying attention to what the company is doing. But we're going to now look at Vista Outdoors kind of through the lens of is this company a company that would be a compounder for us? Which is, by the way, a very high bar, very Uh, high. But it's a, it's a very high bar. I like that. I like having a really high bar because otherwise we'll never find these really uh, rare, highly, oh God, I have no words left. There's something wrong with me. I was wondering well, we where all you know that. that highly thing. I don't know and where I'm, I would go with highly either. I'm going with high, uh, let me see if I can Be describe highly it. Highly compounded. What I wanted to say is highly growth, but that doesn't make any sense. Uh, that they're, <laughs> highly growth like. <laughs> highly growth like. That they're going to grow a lot rapidly and long term into the future. Highly yeah. growing a lot rapidly and long term into growthly. the future. There you That's go. Right. Uh, I bet you that there's a precise word for that, but it did not come into my head. Um, I don't but even care. But that's good. But that's we the goal. The idea. <laughs> <laughs> and those things are rare. And yet I really like in my own experience, like what I love that we're about that we're talking. Oh, my gosh. I should not be doing this. You're doing fine. <laughs> Just, what just I enjoy jump right into the deep end. <laughs> what I enjoy about everybody knows my situation. You know, my brain gets tired. Um, what I enjoy about us talking about compounders specifically is that it's reminding me that that's what's to look for. And I think the noise of Wall Street and financial news is such that it makes me sort of it makes me forget that. And it takes reminding because you start to think, oh, right. Like that company seems pretty good. Oh, I wish I had joined in on that rise of Zoom during the pandemic that nobody could have predicted. Um, Even though maybe it's not like going to be an amazing company in 50 years. Like you start having those thoughts about like, oh, I wish I had done that, or other people are excited about that one. And I personally forget that, no, 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 I'm working on a whole different plane than all these other people. I'm, that's literally, that's, that's what it is. I'm working on a completely different plane of consciousness than they are. We're, We're coming from a place of business ownership. Exactly. That's what we want to think about is business ownership, having a few businesses you own that are really wonderful compounders that you bought at margin of safety prices. So here's this company that we sort of flopped into by um, looking at bell helmets. Why were we looking at bell? Oh, because I don't know. We're looking at bell helmets. Because you like bought one or something, I guess. Yeah. And and essentially what happened was I looked at the, the price of this company Um, Vista Outdoors VSTO is the symbol. So I went online just to kind of give you a sense of what the process is here. Went online and looked at it and it's selling for $27 and my toolbox that I built for myself to, to look at the uh, data coming off this company's financials can make an estimate of what the value would be, you know, as, as best as a computer can at this point. And it's telling me it's worth 86 bucks. So I'm, I'm looking at this in one one quick look. I'm going, whoa, 
selling for 27, maybe worth 86 if everything that the computer is looking at is sensible. I need to look deeper at that. So that's where we start. Okay, that's where we start. Now, the next thing is, who else is owning this baby right now? Am, am I the first person? Oh, wait, so that's one this? of the first things you go to. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'd like to take a look at who else is owning this now. Really? You don't yeah. wait and look at the company a little bit and think about if you're interested in it and if you can understand it. You go straight to Could who do. else is owning it. Could do. Could do. Okay. Okay. Now, I just happen to know a little bit about Vista Outdoors already, so I didn't have to think, well, what do these guys do? <clears throat> I already knew that they had uh, been part of a bigger company, Smith & Wesson. That they spun out pieces of it, and they are yeah. now kind of an outdoor gear. And because we looked at company. that stuff a yeah. few episodes ago. Yeah, so. I mean, but I already, I already knew, knew most of that already. Okay. So yeah, I want to take take a look real quick at who else is in it and that I respect. Mm -hmm. And so what I built was a, a curated group of people who have to put their portfolios uh, available to the public every 90 days. Um, if they have, if they're a, a hedge fund or a mutual fund or a big, any kind of big fund and they're over a hundred million dollars, they have got to say what's in their in their account every 90 days or what they're buying every 90 days or what they're selling every 90 days. So these are the new. 13 F filings. And you guys, mm -hmm. if you haven't listened to these, we've done so many episodes on those. So just search yeah. for 13 F uh, invested podcasts and they'll, they'll come up. Now, if you don't, if you're not, if you don't care who you're looking at, which gurus you're looking at, there's thousands of them. And you know, somebody's in this company for sure. But, None of the 50 some gurus that I'm looking at or I would I would always want to call these guys. I've been calling them gurus for years. I'm going to stop calling them gurus. I'm going to start calling them mentors. Okay. And I got that from Jim McElvey, who was one of the founders of Square. He and and uh, what's the Twitter guy's name? Sold Twitter to Elon Musk. Jack Dempsey, not Dempsey. Jack Dempsey. Dorsey. Yeah. Jack, Jack Dorsey. Dorsey. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Jim and Jack built Square, which is now Block, which is a very successful and, and really, really interesting company that um, I don't understand well enough to buy a piece of. But that aside, Jim wrote a book uh, called The Innovation Stack, which I, we've reviewed on here. We've had Jim on as a, as a guest. And if you haven't read it, go read it. it if, especially book. if you're an entrepreneur, it's required reading if you're an entrepreneur on how you really do create a, a great company and have a niche. And what Jim pointed out to me there that I hadn't realized was that he had these mentors who were really dead people who had written books you know, and or had books written about them. And that was those those were his mentors. I mean some of them were barely alive, I guess, it was some older people. And I'm being a little facetious there and maybe it's not very kind, but they're their, their writing was the critical thing. They had books and Jim could look at those books and read them and know what what this person would want to teach him if he was mentoring him one on one live. And that is so brilliant. So these I'm, I'm calling these gurus men, mentors now. I'm just thinking of them as mentors. These are really excellent investors who we need to pay attention to. So I need okay. to pay attention to them. So the first thing is, oh, here's Vista Outdoors. If it's that great. Has somebody started buying this yet? And the answer in this case was no, no one, zero. So yeah. that's a, hmm, okay. So maybe the price just fell. Maybe it's just now on sale. Maybe it's too little. You know, how big is this company? It's 1.5 billion, so it's not super little. You know, mid cap stock, a little bigger than a small cap, mid cap stock. But that's maybe too small for most of the guys that I'm following. They're pretty big. So, okay, there might be some reasons why nobody's in it. But that's a red flag, right? Yeah, there. that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, that's what I think of immediately is when did this event start happening? And maybe they just haven't had their disclosures come out yet because they are delayed. 
but if I remember right, this company's been in tr- been having some issues for a little bit. Well, they were they were at uh, in November of 2021. They were at forty seven dollars a share. And what are they at now? Twenty seven a share. Okay. So they got hacked pretty good. Yeah. And they've been down in that twenty mid to low twenties now since uh, September of 2022 which is September, October, November, December, January, February, March. There have been at least one guru report, probably really two. Two guru, remember they come out every quarter. Yeah, so there have yeah. been two quarterly reports that have already been done and a third one is coming out in the next few weeks. So there's been two times for gurus to buy into this thing or for mentors to buy into this and they haven't. Despite the fact that it's dropped almost 50%. Okay. Yeah, so that's a red flag. Okay, red flag. All right, red flag. So now, next thing is, okay, well, huh, let's dig into the, what this company does. So what do they do? So I start, I just start going to their website, take a look, and download their 10K, if I haven't already gotten it downloaded, and read about what they do. The 10K is the annual report. We've talked about those forever. Um, and what this is is, a company that has two operating segments that right off the bat, they're telling you they're, they want to split them into ammunition manufacturing and yes, I remember just that. consumer stuff, right? Yeah. Consumer, yeah. Like, uh-oh. So already we've got a company that owns two things that are in two industries that really have nothing to do with each other. Which is why they want to split them. Which is why they want to split them. Good idea. Okay. Um, but now I've got to figure out two companies, not one company. So that immediately, i.e., you makes mean this like harder. you have to decide if you would want to own both of those companies once they do the split? No, I'm more like even if they weren't talking about a split, I would realize this is really two separate companies. Okay, got it. And I would have to evaluate each of them. Uh, so, so in terms of your own understanding, hard. got it? Yeah. Yeah. So if we're looking for something simple, right away they just got immediately less simple than a, a single business company. Yeah, true, true. All right, so now I've got to understand two different industries. Okay, well, that take a breath right there, right? I'm like, hmm, okay. But good news is I already understand one of these industries pretty good. I understand the ammunition industry, and that is almost 60% of its sales. It's mm-hmm. just the ammunition side. And I know the brands that they have. And the reason I know them is because I shoot them. Mm -hmm. Federal Premium, Remington, CCI. So I'm already familiar with a lot of this stuff. And I'm also familiar with the fact that this industry is highly cyclical. And it is pretty much a commodity. There's very little ammunition. When you say this, you're saying the ammunition industry. The ammunition industry. So I'm not a huge fan of owning a commodity business. Now there are some which I've owned in the past, oil and energy and is the one that jumps to my head. Um, and fertilizer, another one. I've owned those two and those are both those are both been very good investments. But this is another question. It adds another red flag. Do I want to own a commodity? Mm-hmm. Because a commodity means that the company has no price power. It can't increase its prices just because its costs have gone up. I'm sorry, but it's a commodity. If everybody else's costs haven't gone up and your costs go up, you're in trouble. Your profits are going to get squeezed because you can't raise your prices. Um, So what you're saying is in the ammunition world, which I know nothing about, people aren't attached to a certain manufacturer. It's like... Not deeply. Not deeply, okay. Not deeply, particularly if you're using... If you're the kind of user that these guys want to sell ammo to, which is somebody that shoots a lot of ammo, right? I think people are very particular when it comes to match type ammunition, but most of those guys are loading their own ammo, right? They're like the people I know that are competitive shooters load their own ammo. They don't buy it from other people. So, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) I'm laughing because I have no idea what these words mean, but that's fine. (laughs) Well, loading your own ammo means it's you fine. take a it's okay. piece I get of brass it. and you put powder you, in it. You, and you do put it in yourself. A it's like rolling um, your own cigarette. Right. It's like rolling your own cigarettes. Exactly. 
So right away, the ammo side of this thing isn't all that appealing, and it's a big chunk of their sales. It's more than half. Hmm. Um, and so, and the other thing about the ammo industry, because I happen to be paying attention to it via the, the reason I'm paying attention to it is because it's an offshoot of the gun industry, which mm-hmm. I have investments in. All right, so I'm paying attention, and they are selling ammo like you're not going to be able to buy any ammunition the rest of your life. It's like you cannot get enough ammo. It's like you cannot get it. You try to buy it, and it's gone. They're they're like, you can't believe it. It's like somebody selling bread at the grocery store, but you can only buy one loaf. Sorry. You know, we got to have bread for our other customers. And you think, well, wow, if that was the case, wouldn't you think a lot of people would be making bread? And the answer is, well, not if the if the government is trying to eliminate bread making. Right. So we have. OK, we have we have a lot of people in this country that would like to eliminate this industry. Yeah, definitely. We, we won't even talk about the, the if that's a wise thing or not. But that is a fact. And so, no, companies are not running out to get into this industry just because they can't make enough ammo because they're afraid they're going to get shut down or sued or who knows what. Got it. Okay. So the regulatory risk, the governmental risk of the industry overall is a very big concern, one for investors probably, two for potential buyers of companies and right. um, and for other companies that may want to get into the industry. So in a way, what I hear you saying is that's kind of a great moat for companies that already do it, but moat, right? they run the risk just as much as anybody else that there will be some kind of governmental intervention. They do indeed. So so it's it's fear of government intervention and then fear of not being politically correct, not being perceived as being uh, a good person, a good fund manager. That fear for investors. Is, yeah, for yeah, an yeah. investor. Yeah. That fear is very, very real. Or a, I mean it doesn't have to be fear, right? Like a lot of people have thought about it greatly and do not want to own an ammunition company for right. Fair ethical enough. reasons. So you've got yeah. people who are in, investing very concerned about environmental governance and what is it ESG environmental social and governance I would think this would fall under social uh, probably owning an ammunition business so that would my guess is that would have a very low score on social yeah I would think by so. whoever decides these things of course for me I think I like to have police who are armed and I would reference the school that you know that just got well shot I was up just and, thinking that this is like this is just my favorite thing about the investing intellectual research process. If we started out with some random helmet that you bought with that had technology that right. we both thought was cool, and we ended up in an industry completely different than helmets, that you have a great deal of personal knowledge about, and mm-hmm. you can bring that knowledge then to your investing research and investing decisions. Like how fun is that process? That little roll of the dice of like, let me check out this helmet company. And you end up with something that you probably hadn't really thought, well, I guess you've, th- you've thought about ammunition companies probably, but um, but to discover that this one's about to spin one off, like I just, I just think it's so fun. It's like this treasure hunt. <laughs> it is a treasure hunt. So, as part of that treasure hunt, you've got to kind of look and see, well, what's the long-term value of the treasure? So when we're looking yeah. at ammunition, I would see that today they're selling everything they can make and they've been doing so for a year or so because they're coming off massive expansion to full, like the demand is exceeding the supply massively mm-hmm. because of COVID-19. I mean, tons of people who hate guns went out and bought them during COVID-19. Um, Civil unrest has happened during COVID-19, political rhetoric uh, on the legislative side, supply uh, chain constraints from not being able to get the stuff they need because of supply chain. So all of this has contributed to demand far exceeding supply. 
So I just have a quick question. Chart. Are we still yeah. in the understanding category yeah, of inquiry? Okay. Yeah. So we are just looking at this thing like, wow, um, these numbers that I'm looking at here for this company in the last year are so much higher when I'm looking over at the financials. So now I'm going to pop over and look at financials. It's part of the 10K, part of okay. looking at everything. And I just see that like the, the, the revenue stream went from, God, it went from like 1.7 million to 3 million. In, a, in two years, it just exploded upwards. And the question is, will that last, right? Is that gonna stick around? And um, and so I'm seeing profits went from like, this company was like 200 million, now it's 600 million in profits in one year. So you gotta look at this and just go, not likely that's gonna keep happening. So the numbers that I've got for the recent years, I probably can't use. Well, this is and where we got numbers. all surprised and mixed well, up. Well, this is the numbers that the computer's using to give me this $87. Oh, you mean on your rule one purchase price. Um, yeah. Toolbox. So the very thing that got me interested in this in the first place is completely wrong. Well, and, and the thing that got us all mixed up in the beginning was that you were looking at those numbers and at the same time, they've just fired their CEO. Which exactly. makes no How bloody does this sense. Go together? Yeah. You get heroic numbers and they just fire their CEO. What? Right. 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 Which means there's something stinky in Denmark here. You know, it's just like, what's going wrong in there that I can't see? And yeah. immediately big red flag. Yeah. So I've got huge numbers here that the market is completely not believing. Yeah, exactly. Completely not buying it. The, the CEO got fired. The CFO left. So what's ringing oh, around in right. my head the is, CFO uh -oh, left. these numbers I can't trust at all. I have no idea, based on the numbers that I'm seeing from these filings in the 10K, whether these are accurate or, you know, Monday morning I'm going to wake up and there's going to be an announcement that Vista is recalculating all of its financials back to 2015. Right. And it's like, oh, man, that's a red flag. Yeah. See what I'm saying? So totally. The red flags are just flying everywhere here. And I'm trying to get to whether this is a compounder, a long-term compounder or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So I, I, first off, I just don't have good numbers to base anything on at this point. Now, that's on the ammo side. Flipping over to the other side of the company, which is, uh, about 43% of its revenue. They call it outdoor products. And they have, this is how we got interested in the first place. They've got brands yep. that we like. Yep. Right? One of my analysts looked at these brands and went like, I own something from every brand on their list. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much my reaction too. There were a couple I hadn't <laughs> right? heard of and the rest of them I was like, oh yeah, that's in my house. And they're distributing these things through all the big guys through, you know, Bass Pro and Dick's and you know, Walmart, and I mean, it's it's very well known brands, very mm -hmm. well known brands. So, wow, maybe maybe that would be pretty good. And then you start to see what's happened with the sales in those brands, which they do break out in their 10K. And these are you know, 21 and 22 all time high years, mm. generating 1.3 billion in sales. Again, is this is this sustainable or is this going to just just dunk right back down to where it used to be forever? And the market is saying it's going to thunk right back down to where it was forever. Hmm. And Mr. Market's pretty smart. You you got to know that the market is. Oh, I'm not sure I've ever smart. heard that sentence come out of your mouth. Oh yeah, I I I know these guys have. I say guys because it's almost all men, and which is a shame, ladies. If you're out there one of the things we really want to see is that this world is 50 50 or because there's no reason not to there's man in terms of doing well with money there's no glass ceiling you can do well with money sitting in your house working for nobody and if you do that 
I love Warren Buffett saying that if you can show you can make 15% a year, people will, will, will swim shark infested waters to get, get their money to you. <laughs> you can jump in and be a pro fund manager on your own without asking anybody's permission. You just have to have a good track record. So, so. in any case, it's mostly guys right now. And that's because Wall Street doesn't really do investing. They do cutthroat everything else. I don't know what they do. But it's not real investing. And um, and so how did I get on that? I, where was I, I going? I have no idea. I don't idea. know where I was going with that. No idea either. But Oh, you um, bought, oh because just, you said Mr. Market uh, is, full of, is really smart. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. And I'm contradicting myself. <laughs> but Mr. Market is smart enough that regularly Mr. Market will price things at their true value. Mm. And so if this thing looks like it's worth 86 and it's being priced at 27, I have to have enough, I have to be humble enough to think maybe Mr. Market's got it right this time instead of having it really, really wrong. So yeah, we've got these major red flags flying up here. CFO is gone. The CEO is gone. It wasn't planned. They're worth working with an with an interim CEO, and um, and the company is in these two separate industries, and the industry that they're calling outdoor products, they have 43 brands. All right, now, wait a second. What kind of company is this? Is this a distribution company? No, because they own all of these brands. They manufacture, they manufacture all them. of these brands. Yeah, so they're manufacturing all kinds of stuff. Bell helmets, Bushnell glass, you know, and like, it says, hmm, w wait a second. If they were a distributor and they were distributing all these things, that would be kind of interesting because if Bushnell isn't selling, they can replace it with something that is selling. Hmm. If Camelbacks are all over, they can go get the stuff that's new. Hmm. But if you own these things, you, I, I have to look at all these. I have to look at every brand they have. Because they're all different. And that starts to become a lot of work. Hmm. I start thinking, damn, hmm. now I've got to know the market for bell helmets. I've got to know the market for camelback water filter, water systems, for gyro helmets, which are different than bell helmets. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now all of a sudden, my simple little company has turned into this kind of monster where I've got to be able to distinguish which of these brands is likely to do well? Now, part of my concern about that comes from Warren Buffett making a rather heavy-duty mistake. Warren doesn't make very many mistakes, but he made a mistake about brands. I was he just going to say, that, it reminds me of Kraft. Exactly. He thought that Kraft brands were all valuable brands, and they didn't go out and explore each brand to see if it was going to hold up. And it turns out, People don't care as much as they used to. Or, I mean, maybe you know something I don't, but I, or he he did investigate each brand. I have no idea, and decided that he thought they were valuable and Could was wrong. Be they made a mistake in the investigation. Yeah. Was wrong, yeah. But it turns out if you put your brands in Costco, people are just as happy to go down there and buy Kirkland, which is the Costco brand, as they are to buy. As long as it know, tastes the same, you know. As long as it tastes the same. Yeah. Yeah, and so they had to write down you know, better. billions of dollars. They took a loss of billions to write these brands down when their accountants started to realize that these brands are not as valuable as they thought they were. Mm. So that would be the process I would have to go through here. I would have to go look at every one of these brands and determine how it's stacked up. Is it number one in this industry? Is it number five? Is it going up? Is it going down? And that just became too much. So that was it for me. That's as far as I really needed to go. That's as far just, as you went. Okay, let me recap. Yep. So you went, do I understand it enough? You could understand the ammunition side, it sounds like. But the outdoor side was immediately realizing like way too complicated to investigate into this thing. Who else was buying it? Nobody. Mega red flag for you. And then looking at what you saw as the intrinsic value of the company based on the last few years and discovering that 
last year was an anomaly insane year, which is first of all skewing that calculation. And then secondly, that the market was pricing it completely differently than than what the last year was telling us. Adding to that internal personnel issues, the CEO leaving very abruptly being a major one and the C- CFO yeah. leaving being another major one, which to me is a huge red flag when you have strange numbers that are confusing and the CFO leaving, yep. who is the guy who has yep. to sign all of these things. Um, who knows? Maybe everything's fine. I have no idea. But that's that's a strange one. Yep. So I, you know, basically a little more digging would turn up that Vista Outdoors got pretty close to bankruptcy a few years ago. That mm. although these brands are number one or number two in their industry in terms of revenue and they've got really good shelf space, the the customer, in my view anyway, the customer uh, connection, is that the right word, to the brand? You know, like where you really... You know, like if I'm going to go drink a cola, it's going to be Coca-Cola. I mean, I will drive to go get a Coca-Cola. Yeah. Right. So I'm a customer that's deeply connected to that brand. Um, Not so much. I don't really care whether I buy a Bell helmet for racing or whether I get a different brand manufacturer. What I care is what fits. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, you know, boots that I'm going to walk in or. You know, all this stuff is all about, it just fit, it has to fit. And I don't really care what the brand is as long as it's a good brand. So I don't have the same attachment to the brands uh, as I do on other brands that I think are, are compounders, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, people just go and get C's candy because that's a tradition in their family and they send it out for birthdays and they send it out and it says C's candy on it and it's like a family business and it's like they're attached to it and yeah. it just keeps going forever. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, understanding the business is going to be tough. That's the first thing. ROE, ROIC, that's the next thing I want to look at. And it's quite good in this company, but only recently. Hmm. That's why we like to go back 10 or 15 years and look at a company and see what's going on. And now that they've lost their management team, how do I know that these numbers aren't going to go right back where they were and send this company spiraling down the tubes? So my concern that this may not be a long-term compounder is starting to grow here, right? So, you know, the next thing I want to look at is debt. Um, they're they're running they're running a little bit more debt. They've increased it from two hundred million to one point one billion over the last three or four years. Like, oh, oh, that's going the wrong way. I don't mm. like that at all. That's mm. another big red flag. Um, and so with all those red flags, I mean, basically my conclusion is, it's just, this is too hard. I, it's too hard. I just don't know if I can, if it's worth the time to dig into all of these different brands and to figure out why they're adding debt and to figure out why the CEO left and why the CFO left. And it's just too hard. So there you go. In, in a relatively short period of time, I mean, that probably total time, there was probably an hour or so. Hmm. Uh, of reading and I can really quickly get to the point where if Sam, if I'm looking for a compounder that I don't have to think about, this ain't it. Hmm. Hmm. Well, and this company may end up being a huge, massive success. Could be. Could grow. It's cheap. It's cheap. It could grow. They could be making a fantastic decision, spinning off the ammunition section from the outdoor section and 10 years from now, we look back on this and go like, well, we missed that one. Sure. And I think the important part is knowing that that one, that's going to happen with some companies. I don't know about this one. We will have missed things and we've talked about them and it's very painful. But yeah. two, that I think we just kind of have to accept that as part of the process. If we're going to allow ourselves to dismiss companies that are too hard and not keep at it. I mean, like if you really wanted to learn about this company and really dig in, you could, of course, go spend the next month working on Vista Outdoor. You would understand it, but it's just not worth it is what you're saying. There's other ones. Not at this point. 
Yeah. There's so many, there's so many other companies. There's so many good companies. There's so many companies where they have a great management team that is never leaving that business. You know, just too many red flags here. So there's kind of how we do it. And that's how, that's how I, I thought it might help you guys to just kind of see a live run through. I think it's uh, really cool. A company that looked really interesting, but it turns out ultimately for me anyway, too hard. Now, yeah. for some of you out there, you might be all over this and it could turn out to be a great investment for you because it certainly is cheap, mm-hmm. but not, not, not right for me. So okay. there we go. There we go. Time to go we'll play. We'll be back next week. Thanks everybody. See you guys. Bye. Hi guys, thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding, they really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And it's really important, it's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that. You're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I really hope you enjoyed it.